The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. I just started having a lot of conviction for, for this lifestyle I was living, for the, the content, the words that are in my music. And, and here I was kind of with this opportunity uh, in this platform. And that not only was I not using it for God's glory and honor, I was doing the opposite in most ways. Award-winning singer-songwriter Curtis Grimes explains the shift in his personal life and his music, next on Life Today. Hi, welcome to Life Today. I'm Sheila Walsh here with Randy Robinson. Let me ask you a question. If you were to think of three things that Scottish people love, <laughs> I wonder what you'd come up with. You might come up with haggis. <laughs> you might come up with the movie Braveheart. <laughs> but did you know that something that's huge in Scotland is country music? We love country. And today we have a very special Texas country star with us, Curtis Grimes. I want to welcome you to Life Today. Thanks Thank for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. Back us up a little bit, though. Just, I mean, before we get to, you know, <laughs> the big stages, the country music stages, uh, take us back a little bit so we can understand how you got where you're at now. Because you didn't start out with a guitar. You started out with a, with a baseball bat, right? That's right. I lived about two hours east of, east of Dallas, and uh, Nolan Ryan was my guy. Yeah. And so from, from early on, five years old, I wanted to pitch for the Rangers. And, uh, and, I, and I was pretty good at it. I had, I had been blessed with the, with the talent. Um, and I was a pitcher, so my entire childhood, that's what I did. And we did the spring ball, fall ball, year round, everything. Uh, wound up getting a scholarship to go uh, to Shreveport, Louisiana and play college ball. And my roommate there had a guitar sitting in the dorm room. And I was just getting into this whole like Texas country underground, didn't really get played on the radio kind of stuff. You had to dig around on mm -hmm. the internet to find it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I picked up the guitar, those were the kind of songs that I tried to play and, and write. Um, and so that's where it started really, uh, 19 years old in my college dorm room. And uh, then it just kind of went from there. Well, I, I read somewhere, and this can't be true, that you gave up baseball for a girl. <laughs> it is true, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, quickly regretted that when, <laughs> when that, that, that fell through. Uh, so then I, then I didn't have baseball, and just music was kind of what I dove into to, to fill that void. And it was, it was therapeutical in a lot of ways. And uh, that's, that's what got me into writing songs, just kind of feelings on paper and then putting that to music. And um, so the next year I went down to, to San Marcos, Texas, which is uh, about an hour south of Austin. Mm -hmm. And that was really a live music scene. That's kind of where all these guys I was listening to played a bunch of shows. So then I started going and I just would be in the crowd watching the guy on stage where he put his fingers on the guitar. <laughs> then I'd go home and try to do the same. And did that for a couple of years, pieced together a band. And then in 2008, three years after I even touched that thing, uh, we won a local radio contest to open for Kenny Chesney. Wow. And this was like, I don't know if y'all remember, Kenny was like the man for like yes. five years. Fifth year entertainer of the year, biggest country music concert event of the year. And there we were. Wow. And you go from playing in front of like, I don't know, 30 or 40 people at a little dive bar to 16,000 people in the Irwin Center. Yeah. And it was so surreal, like mm -hmm. just happened so fast. The only thing I specifically remember was my mom was there, like in the rafters. So of course I was like, she was. Hi, mom. Like, that, was <laughs> that was like the only thing that in the moment I remembered and took home. <laughs> then I got to see videos later and, and just kind of relive it through that. But, but that happened three years in, three years after that. Um, get a call from my manager one day. Hey, there's this new show called The Voice that's gonna be auditioning in Austin on Saturday. Well, the problem was, I was supposed to play my mom's 50th birthday party on Saturday. Oh. So I said, well, if they can squeeze me in early in the morning, then I'll go do that, and then make it to mom's thing. So they did, and uh, wound up making the, the round, the, the cut. So I had to drive up there, do that, drive back, do round two, and they said, you may never hear from us again, but um, if you do, then good luck, you know. Two weeks later, 
on a plane to Los Angeles. Wow. Wow. I've never been there, never been on the camera side of things. All I knew was show up, set up PA, play a show, go home. <laughs> and so that opened just an entire new world of, of music in the, the industry and the business side of it for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and from a career standpoint, great. I'm curious also at the same time, what was sort of the spiritual background of your life? So I grew up. Uh, Southern Baptist Church. So we were in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, Wednesday night, night. Yeah. and that's all I knew. And, I, and, and had a very good, good faith foundation, very godly home, um, no drinking, no cussing, just pretty straight laced. Um, and I'm thankful for that. I'm very thankful for that. And so that's, that's kind of all I knew. And uh, when I was in high school, uh, I, and back to, I got saved when I, the day before I turned nine. So, hmm. so the day before I turned numb, it was the night before it was revival week at our church and just Holy Spirit just at my heart. Yeah. And I, I was in there that night before, I was crying before I go to bed and my dad's like, what's wrong? So I was like, oh, you know, I need, I need to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And, and if I die right now, like I'm going to hell and like I have to need to get this right, like right now. <laughs> he said, okay, just tomorrow we'll go talk with the pastor and just like share, share with him kind of how you're feeling. And so we went down there and did that. So that's, that's where I was nine years old very active in our, our RA program, mm -hmm. youth group. Um, freshman year, I made varsity a baseball team as a pitcher. And probably sophomore year, I went to one of the baseball parties and started hanging out. Well, then there's stuff going on there that was not going on in my house. And so that's, that, that's like where I had my first beer. And I remember it was so bad, like I went in the bathroom and poured it out just so, <laughs> so I was cool and like finished the beer, you know? And so that's where I was. And so, by the end of my senior year, I'd gone to more of these things and really kind of got into that. Then, of course, you're in with the temptation of, of girls and everything that comes with that as, as, an, as a youth. Sure. Um, and so that's when I went off to college, that increased. Mm -hmm. The accountability of my parents weren't there no more yeah. to get up and make sure I was going to church on Sunday. And, um, and that's really kind of where I fell off. Stopped getting in the Word, mm -hmm. stopped praying, other than maybe blessing food on occasion. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where I was when I got into the music thing. Well, of course, if y'all aren't familiar with the music industry, a lot of that's drinking, partying. <laughs> How can we profit off of this lifestyle? Sure. So I thought that's the lifestyle that you lived and that's what you did if you sang music for a living. Completely contradictory to everything that I knew was and wasn't right. And the whole time, I had the conviction the whole time. I was just ignoring it and just, and just really trying to justify everything and, and um, about six, seven years into that, so probably about three years after The Voice, uh, I just started having a lot of conviction for, for this lifestyle I was living, for the, the content, the words that are in my music. And, and here I was kind of with this opportunity uh, in this platform and that not only was I not using it for God's glory and honor, I was doing the opposite in most ways. And um, so I was on the way to the gym at about midnight one night, and uh, the song, Andre Crouch song, Through It All came on. Yeah. And that was just like the most reassuring thing in the world, the simple fact that through all of this, through how I was living, how hypocritical I was being, how like professing to be a Christian and then just not like, that whole thing, if you're to stand trial for being a Christian, is, is, Christian, is there enough evidence to convict you? And like for me, there wasn't wow. in, in every other regard. Um, and so I just made a point from then on that, that if I'm gonna do music, if I'm gonna, I've been given this talent and this platform, then, then not only once should I get my priorities right and start living for the Lord, you know, not just, be a Christian because I got saved and now I got the fire insurance and live how I want. Yeah, like right. that's not how it works. Sure. Yeah. And just so that is when I really try to start pursue walking with the Lord, start actively trying to live like Christ who dwells in me. And um, when I was a kid, I always tell people, when I grow up, I want to picture the Rangers and I want to use that platform to tell, tell people about Jesus. Because I, I always read the Sports Illustrated for kids and they'd have little articles from people like Reggie White who would share their faith. Mm -hmm. And that was so cool to me sure. as, a, you know, as, sure. a, as a little Christian that, that was on fire for the Lord, you know. And so here I was, not playing baseball, but definitely had a big platform and, and reach. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so that was probably just as hard as the just the conviction of being a hypocrite. What and, I want to uh, ask you though is when you make this, when you hear this song, which I love that song, and you you determine that you're going to change direction, you know, you're going to change your life. How did the people around you receive that, like your record label or all your people? <laughs> so <laughs> the next trip to Nashville, this was in like a September time, and that I was going to go to Nashville. And uh, we were supposed to have a marketing meeting to kind of with this little plan of, and they wanted to release a song called Keg Party. <laughs> and so all this stuff, just that brand. And so before the meeting starts, and there were, was like this entourage office in the Gulch in Nashville, ritzy stuff, 12 people around a big table. And I was like, hey guys, before we get started today, like this is where I'm at. Like I don't drink anymore. I, I want to do positive, faith-based, traditional country music. And I don't know how it's going to work, but like that's just where my heart is. I don't feel comfortable releasing this kind of song. Like that's just not me. And, uh, and so one guy out of the 12 came up to me afterwards and was like, I'm proud of you. Like uh -huh. that's awesome. That's respectable. In December, everybody dropped me. <laughs> Management <laughs> dropped me. Booking agent dropped me. Everybody that was working with me dropped me, except for my radio promoter. She, she didn't give up on me. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I didn't know, you know, how, what to do at that point. I knew that after I said, this is what I'm going to do, my initial thought was, well, maybe I need to remove myself from this environment, you know, like just yeah, get, sure. get out from being surrounded by people that, that sure. engage in this in the temptation aspect of it. But God was like, no, I put you there for a reason. Mm -hmm. So like, whatever you think you're gonna do, go lead and worship in a church or whatever else, like do that at the venues you're playing at now, cause that's where the people that need to hear it most are. It's and so that's what yeah. kept me, yeah. I guess, in this realm and in, in, in the Texas country music industry. Yeah. And, um, and also too, I never really understood the concept of walking with the Lord, like <laughs> actually, pursuing Christ in that manner like yes. not just when you die and go to heaven like I need him just right as now. much if not more right, right now mm -hmm. than than on the other side of the dirt oh, yeah. and so that really <laughs> came to came to I guess I, guess I got clarity of, of what that meant and actually applying it and so then it, it changes everything it, it changes does. how you engage with people how you try to reach people versus like hey you're, you're doing something wrong. That's bad. Don't do it. You know, yeah. here's why. Yeah. Versus like, hey, I love you and I've been there. I'm, mm -hmm. I've done that. And, 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 and when I removed all of that stuff out of the way, and then, then God was actually able to use me and not just me walking around with, with the cross badge on my, yeah. on my yep. chest, you yep. know? Well, love we it. cannot have Curtis Grimes, country star, <laughs> with us and not sing something for us. Would you sing something for us? Oh, so I just wrote a song last Thursday night. Wow. That we went into the, the studio to record in Nashville on Tuesday and I needed another song. And a pastor friend of mine had given me this idea a couple days before, but I was playing with my kids. I was about to be gone for a week. So I was like, you know what? Priorities. I'll, <laughs> I'll try that later. And so I played with my kids and did a little voice memo. A couple nights later, I got back kind of from the gym kind of late and I was still wide awake. So I said, all right, I'm gonna try to work on that song now. So I got my guitar and just conversation. All right, God, I need, I need, a, need a, another song for the album. Will you just give me the words and, um, and use this for you, however it is. <laughs> and I, I, to be honest, I haven't done that a lot. You know, we hear the asking it shall be given if you're asking in the right, in his will. And I just, for whatever reason, I haven't done that a whole lot, but this time I did, and in one hour, I wrote this song, and, and of course, it's testimonial and kind of my story and where I was at, and, and kind of my message now, and, and how I approach it, too. So um, it's called Honky Tonk Preacher. <laughs> smoke and the neon I saw the light I sat there and wondered well how could it be that he cared about an old sinner like me he told me how Peter denied him three times and how old King David fell once or twice about love and forgiveness 
mercy and grace, how a tomb was left empty. When a stone rolled away, he's a honky-tonk preacher on Saturday nights. His church is a dance hall full of liquor and lies. He's telling a story he knows all too well about a highway to heaven off a dead end to hell he don't do it for the money the show or the fame he's a honky-tonk preacher fit for king he said i spent years in the bottom of a glass chasing that demon a ghost from the past till I hit rock bottom and all I could see was a hand reaching out where a nail used to be he's a honky tonk preacher on Saturday nights his church is a dance hall full of liquor and lights he's telling a story he knows all too well about a highway to heaven off a dead end to hell he don't do it for the money the show or the fame he's a honky-tonk preacher fit for a king then he left me with this a soft-spoken word no fire brimstone just salt of the earth a few simple verses from first john three he's a honky-tonk preacher fit for a king wow you heard it here first people <laughs> that was beautiful I, I heard something interesting about what you have on a table at your gigs that people can just like pick up for free Yes, ma'am. So, so not long after I, I made all these other changes in my life, people started asking if I would ever consider doing a gospel album. And I uh, said, I would love to, but I don't really have just money laying around to do a side project at the moment. Uh, so we started up a GoFundMe campaign and, and people donated and gave and we raised more than enough money to do this gospel album. And, and I didn't want to profit off of this. You know, it's just supposed to be more of a, here you go, some, some good positive stuff country music going out in the world um, and so I started up a ministry and God just put it on my heart in that moment of everybody that, that, that you come in contact with doesn't have a Bible and for me that's kind of weird because they're laying around the house you know and uh, of course you we understand across the sea there are people that get persecuted for having one in their house but like here in America there are people that just never had a Bible for whatever reason and uh, so initially I just bought some to put them on their merch table and, uh, and they would slowly kind of dwindle down people are sometimes kind of awkward or nervous about asking for one uh, so I just keep filling them up and then uh, kind of started up a website where people could go online and request one and then different mission groups have come along so we'll send cases cases wow. off with them and uh, uh, the time I was trying to figure out a name for the ministry uh, my grandfather had passed away and, and he had he had nine fingers most of his life when he's little he's roping a horse and dog spooked it and here we are so after the Ooh. after the, the funeral we were at his house and my dad was talking about how now he's got ten perfect fingers to worship the Lord and uh, so kind of in his honor and, and piggybacking off of that, we named it Ten Finger Ministry. I love that. And uh, <laughs> we've given out over 6,000 Bibles so far. Wow. So it's, it's, uh, it's been uh, pretty I love incredible. it. Yeah, yeah I, I love it. I love it. So if you're ever wondering what Texas country music sounds like, that, there you go right there. But what, what you're doing, Curtis, and what I love about this is that you are, you are giving away the gospel, but utilizing what you have. What God's given you, you're giving it back. And I just love that. I think it's a great picture for all of us. Yeah, know. and I love that line, the, the hand reaching out where there used to be a nail. We get to be that today. There's some children around the world uh, who are at this very moment literally starving to death. And you and I have this incredible privilege of saying, not on our watch, we're going to be Jesus' boots on the ground. We watch this.
The devastating effects of a food crisis has driven these mothers to leave their villages to seek help. Their children are starting to show signs of the silent killer known as malnutrition. In malnutrition clinics like this all over Angola, there are children that are literally fighting a fight of life and death. These areas in Southern Africa have the worst child mortality rates under five of anywhere in the world. The children you see around me in this clinic are literally children that are being ravaged by malnutrition simply because they don't have enough food. And that is the reality for a child like this little Josephina. Josephina is a two-year-old child suffering from severe malnutrition, the silent killer that is literally ravaging her little two-year-old body to the point where she can't even raise herself and hold her own body weight. Her mother, Marta, literally is left with nothing else to do. She's done everything she can do to save her child's life. And now all she can do is watch, wait, and pray. Pray that her child will survive. My prayer is that we haven't reached this child too late. My prayer is that the therapeutic food that we're bringing this child will save its life and bring her back to full strength. But my other prayer is that we're able to reach the many mothers in villages all over this area, just like Marta, mothers who are so desperate for food, mothers who don't have the food to feed their children, that we can reach them before their children end up in malnutrition clinics, fighting that fight of life and death. You know, I've tried to put myself in the shoes of a mom like Marta. I remember the first time I was in, in Angola and went to one of the malnutrition clinics. And I remember seeing these little ones who were just struggling for the next breath and wondering how could things possibly get any worse than this? But what I want to tell you today is they have got worse. Things, Angola is now facing the worst situation of um, drought and loss of all agriculture in 40 years. It was devastating when I was there a few years ago and now it's worse. And I think about that mom, Marta. She loves her little Josefina as much as I love my son Christian. And I remember the joy it used to be when, when Christian was a little boy and he would clean his whole plate and he loved it. And I would just, there was just something about it just felt so right. But these moms, they're doing everything they possibly can. I have walked with them for a long distance where they try and dig through the earth to try and find anything that would potentially fill their little one's bellies and come up empty handed. But here's what's amazing to me the number of these women who still faithfully look to Jesus and pray and ask God to send help. And the great news is you and I, Brandy, we get to be the answer to that prayer. We do, and you know, Sheila, we've been there before during difficult times. These, these are cycles that happen in, in nature and crops and things like that. It's no fault of their own. They work, they work very hard, but it's difficult in these third world countries because crops fail or storms come or drought comes. And when those situations occur, you have stood by us, our audience, our friends, our partners, in going in and, and saying, you know what, we're not gonna let death win. We're gonna intervene for a time uh, so that we stave off the starvation and the malnutrition. And Sheila, we've seen it. We've seen it when we go into these villages where mission feeding is occurring and you see it's a radical difference the children are learning, they're preparing for their future, they're working a lot of times, they're, they're happy, they're smiling, they're singing. But then we see the places where it's hit them hard and they need mission feeding. They need someone like you and I to come in just for a time period to get them through a rough season. I mean, sometimes, you know, if I miss a meal a day, I, I think, you know, I'm feeling faint. But well, you're talking about a week? two weeks, a month, two months, it, it quickly becomes a problem. But just as quickly as the problems arise, the solution can arrive for them. And the solution is you and I. Your gift today of $30 will help feed three children for three whole months. And for a lot of them, that's all they need to get them through a dif difficult period. Your gift of $50 will help feed five children for the three months. Some of you can give $1,000 and feed 100 children for three months. I'm encouraging you, whatever you can do, just reach out, partner with us. Let's be that answer to that mother's prayer 
She's asking, Lord, help us. And I think God's saying, my people are there. Will you be that person? Go to the phone, go online, give the best gift you can, and know that when you partner with us in Mission Feeding, you will be saving lives. Across the continent of Africa, children are suffering, facing severe malnutrition and even death. With food reserves gone and many areas experiencing severe famine, we urgently need to replenish supplies to keep feeding the 350,000 children who are counting on us. Through Life's Mission Feeding Outreach, your gift of love can be an answer to prayer for a hurting and hungry child in their time of need. Call now with your life-saving gift of $30, $50, or $100 to help feed and care for three, five, or ten children for three full months. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you the chosen 40 Days with Jesus. From the creators of the widely popular television drama, The Chosen, this devotional invites you to discover Jesus through the eyes of those who knew him best. With your gift of $100 or more, please request the Amazing Grace Sheet Music Frame Wall Art. This timeless and well-beloved hymn can be displayed as a reminder of God's grace to you. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our inspiring bronze sculpture, Let the Children Come. This beautiful bronze is a reminder to care for children around the world in both word and deed. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. I hope you will go online, go to the phones now, make the best gift you can. You will be saving a life, and we appreciate you partnering with us, and we appreciate our guest today, Sheila. I yeah. thought this was just fun. I know it was, Curtis, but beautiful story, beautiful music, and, and I know that your songs are doing really well. One went straight to number one on iTunes. So people look up Curtis Grimes' music. Thank you for being with hey, us. Thank you all so much for having me. This, awesome. is, this is awesome. No, it's great to have you, and it's great to have you. Join us again next time here on Life Today. Regardless of your net worth, estate planning benefits you and your family. Do not put off this important step to peace of mind. Contact Life Planning Services today. Stay connected with Life Today through your favorite social media sites or visit lifetoday.org where life is always on. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.